Okay, so why don't you go ahead and uh, introduce yourself and what you do here at ATR. Uh, Grover Norquist. I'm president of Americans for Tax Reform, and we're a nationwide political organization that fights for lower taxes. Okay, and so uh, did uh, ATR take a specific stance on the foreign policy towards Iraq, or what? what is your own uh, view on okay. the policy? Americans for, Americans for Tax Reform doesn't stake out foreign policy uh, positions as an individual uh, activist, I'm allowed to generally have uh, opinions, but uh, Americans for Tax Reform does not have a s position on Iraq or terrorism or something like that. Okay, so uh, what is your own personal position then? On that? Um, well, I, I supported the effort. Uh, I supported the effort uh, by the United States to overthrow the Taliban regime uh, and to go after Al Qaeda. Uh, and at the time that people were looking at Iraq and the Iraqi Ba'athist regime was not willing to let us uh, l look for weapons of mass destruction. And given that we know that at one point Saddam Hussein did have chemical weapons, because he'd, he'd used them uh, against Iran and against the Kurds, uh, it struck me as reasonable to assume that he had someone that he was hiding them and that he would be willing to use them against us, even in ways that risked his regime. The argument that, oh, he wouldn't do it because we would kill him, uh, well, he invaded Iran and almost lost his regime, and he invaded Kuwait and almost lost his regime, and he tried to murder uh, President uh, Bush 41, and if Clinton had been a serious president, that would have cost him his uh, regime. So it's a guy who's taken huge chances uh, risking the annihilation of his person and regime. So the fact that deterrence did not strike me as sufficient uh, for a risk taker like that. With the Soviet Union, very conservative. Deterrence obviously worked for quite some time. Uh, with him, deterrence hadn't worked um, and might not work. So I thought it was reasonable to assume he had weapons of mass destruction, that he would share them. I didn't know whether he had particular contacts with guys that were bad guys, but that's not necessary. You can make a phone call and get in contact with bad guys, even if you'd never spoken before. So um, I, w I was supportive of, of the effort to knock him out. Okay. And uh, when you look at the, the performance of both the print and television news media, mm -hmm. do you follow the media closely? And if you do, then uh, can you kind of evaluate uh, their performance over this time period? Uh, well, the American media, like the American people, tends to be awfully inwardly focused. And we don't get a lot of news from overseas. Uh, and so the American people are unlikely to have any sort of context to put something uh, into. Uh, on the nightly news, countries are either good or bad, and our foreign policy is either ignore or kill. Uh, and because there's very little news about other countries, the American people tend, one, tend to be uninterested. We don't want to run them. We don't want to do anything to them. It doesn't offend our sensitivities that they belong, believe in the wrong God or uh, don't do things the way we do as long as they're not shooting at us. So once the American people become convinced somebody's shooting at us, then they want the government to go blow them up and make them go away. Uh, so there really is this ignore, kill dichotomy, and the press, by starting to talk about something an awful lot, can build up the American people towards the, the kill end. Um, and so it, it, it's, it's an interesting thing that they want to be, perhaps want to be somewhat careful about uh, within the context of what's happening in the world. And, and when you look at issues that are very complex, um, mm -hmm. how do you, uh, any abstract complex issue, there's going to be a lot of different perspectives and angles. Do you see that there's a general trend that any time there's a very complex issue that the media has to oversimplify it to, uh, to kind of like lose a lot of the, the nuance and the meaning? Well, on foreign policy, uh, unless you'd been following what's happening in the Middle East or Iran, Iraq for 10 or 20 years, uh, to jump into a discussion of who Saddam Hussein is and what he is and what risks he would or wouldn't take is, is difficult to do. Uh, and, so it's, and because the, the, the media, for its own reasons and financial reasons, that you can only put so much foreign news on, people only watch so much, um, 
And if you did put, if you had hours and hours of the stuff on TV, it's unclear that the American people would decide to turn in to that channel, given that they have a hundred options. So when you only have a small amount of time, uh, I think it's hard not to end up directing the American people in one direction or another, because you can't possibly uh, give a broad view of one country, never mind a region or the world. Um, because the decision to invade Iraq was really a decision of what do you do after Afghanistan. One option would have been attack Cuba. One action might have been quarantine Iraq or Iran or Syria or North Korea. I mean, there, there are any number of things that if, if your position was, we're going to get tough, we're going to be tough, we're going to be strong, you could have been tough by blowing up North Korea, you could have been tough by liberating Cuba, you could have been tough by trying to shut down trade with Iran. Uh, any number of options, how do you possibly get that into two minutes on the nightly news? And so do you see a, a, a general trend that uh, is also a criticism on society that the market's not demanding this hard-hitting news, and since they're not demanding it, it's not being provided, and then you kind of have this vicious cycle in a way. And is there, is that, do you see that as an issue of as we go further along, the, it's becoming more risky for producers to, to make these types of, uh, let's say, news documentaries co covering hard news? Well, one could write books, one could do pamphlets, one could do talk radio. Uh, there are lots of ways, uh, there are websites. So if somebody felt strongly that more and better information needed to get out on, on some issues, um, to complain that CBS isn't doing it is a little disingenuous. Because unless you own CBS, that's not your decision. People are always trying to, oh, somebody else should spend the time and the money and the effort to go do what I think is important. Uh, if somebody wants to tell you, oh, people should have, should have, could have, would have done X, the question to ask that person is, and you did what? Did you set up a website with the information that you think the American people don't have? Did you get on talk radio with the information that you think people didn't have? I mean, the people who think that either this administration made a wrong decision um, or could have done something different if only people had known X. Well, what effort was made to get X out, or is this 2020 hindsight and whining? So it's, 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 it's an interesting question, but the fact that something wasn't on, lots of things aren't on TV. Um, the entire conservative revolution in the United States from 1994 was never on TV. It was on talk radio, it was on op-ed pages, it was on phone calls, it was on direct mail. It happened, but you'd have never known it be if you'd waited for CBS to cover it. So on foreign policy and some of these other issues, if somebody has a complaint about the level of information in the United States, the response ought to be to that person, did you write a book? Did you do, okay, so you don't do, do a magazine article? Did letters to the editor? Um, radio talk show host? Did you do a website? What was done to get out the information somebody thinks is important? And if it was important, the American people aren't foolish. If you get out important information to them, they will pick it up. But just because you think it's important doesn't mean people do. But, and I think in, in this, this context, even the New York Times has come out to say, you know, we, our reporting was not as rigorous as it could have mm -hmm. been. And so you have this general acknowledgement by both the Washington okay. Post and New York Times that but, they weren't as skeptical. And I've talked to people who were trying to submit op-eds to the Washington mm -hmm. Post, and they were, right. not, they were being turned down. Why would you expect the Washington Post or the New York Times to be skeptical of American foreign policy? They take as dictation uh, press releases from the Department of Housing and Urban Development saying we did X today. And they cover what government claims it's doing domestically. For 60 years we had a welfare system that was, according to itself, was helping poor people. We now know that it was locking them into welfare dependency and hurting poor people. Who wrote that story? Not the New York Times, not the Washington Post. They wrote, the federal government today said they helped poor people by sending the money. Uh, next story. So why would we be surprised that the Washington Post and the New York Times, when told by the federal government, uh, we're doing X, Y, and Z on foreign policy, why would you expect them to do something other than take dictation the way they do on domestic policy? The, the statism agreeing with the government, 
is not, we think of it as left of center um, uh, promotion of statism when they agree with domestic policy. Uh, but in point of fact, it's actually lazy journalism. It's not liberal journalism, it's lazy journalism. The government today told me to tell you X, so I'm doing so. And whether that's on domestic policy or foreign policy, it's just taking dictation out of press releases. Happens all the time at the state level, at the local level. What, what local newspaper takes on the mayor? What state newspaper takes on the state government and says the central premise of this state government's policy on transportation or welfare or education isn't correct. Why would you expect them to do that uh, even if there were legitimate questions on a foreign policy issue? And if, you go, if you hold up to the ideals of what journalism should be, you know, there's these ideals of what they should be striving to do, but then there's the reality of the institutional biases. So do you mm -hmm. see that, that they should be striving to challenge these things more, challenge the government or challenge the status quo? Well, hopefully a journalist wants to get out accurate information to citizens. And if the government is not getting out accurate information, then one is in a position of challenging the government. Uh, if the government's correctly portraying what's going on, then, then w what the press puts out reinforces that. Uh, it's not as if the press ought to be constantly disagreeing with the government just because if it, because the thing's supposed to disagree. It ought to be trying to give a correct analysis of what's happening in the world. And if the government's off doing something goofy, then a correct analysis of what's happening in the world is a criticism or an implied criticism of the government. Um, and I guess part of what you do also is cover critics of the government. The government today said X. Alternative views were Y and Z. Even if you thought they were flawed in a, in a free and open society, it is, a, it is news that the leading opposition party had a different sense of what was going on. People ought to know that. Even, even if it's not, you should know this because it's true, you should know it because Ted Kennedy thinks it and he's one of the leaders of the Democratic Party. And, and what happens when both the opposition and the majority party actually happen to agree on certain issues? Can the press come in and fill that void of when there should be still further debate? Um, the press can challenge a consensus if it gets out information that the American people view as accurate uh, and, and reasonable. One of the challenges you have is that the American press, at least the three networks, over the last 30 years has been so consistently um, group think, and from my perspective as a taxpayer, left of center in their prejudices, the government's always right, the government's always right, the government's always right, on domestic policy. Um, why would you not expect them to exhibit that same kind of group think when you deal with Albania uh, as when they deal with welfare? Okay, and uh, when you when you look from the uh, perspective of a, of a taxpayer, can you speak mm -hmm. toward towards these uh, uh, interventions over overseas that may be uh, justified to the par to the public as a humanitarian uh, intervention, but legally the legal case that they're giving is a weapons of mass destruction or national security? Uh, do you see that shift happening of saying now this is a humanitarian intervention, uh, specifically in Iraq? When a child gives you 12 reasons that they didn't do something or 12 reasons that they did something, it's because there isn't one that they're willing to tell you about. Uh, and governments do the same thing. If they're giving you many, many reasons why they did something, that one would suffice if it was the real reason. And you begin to wonder wh why you're getting so many different reasons. Uh, now, there may be several good reasons to do something, but uh, if the reasoning keeps changing, it makes you wonder what the government meant to say and what, what its goals were, what it was actually trying to accomplish. Um, why would we expect this press, this media, to be a ser serious critic, an informed critic of something like the war in Iraq when for the last 50 years you could look at the track record of foreign aid and how that money has often been handed over to dictators wasted, uh, the countries we help more with foreign aid do less well than the countries we don't. Um, there's, CBS has never pointed out that South Korea and Taiwan started to succeed after we cut them off from foreign aid. 
and that Tanzania is not functioning uh, because we continue to give it money so it doesn't have to reform. Um, that goes on every day. It's not some, and that's not odd or weird or different, and you can compare it across state lines, you can compare it over time. When something very different, like Iraq is or isn't a threat to us, takes place, that's a very difficult question and something difficult to judge. Uh, the establishment press hasn't even come close to figuring out the easy stuff overseas. Why would you expect them to get the difficult stuff right? And it, it seems like there is this cancer, then, what I'm hearing from you, that the press is, uh, many times, there. it seems, from my, when I'm looking at this time period, covering events as opposed to covering issues over time or looking at the difference between rhetoric and behavior, even mm -hmm. if, if there are differences of the actual actions. The establishment press on foreign policy, as with domestic policy, looks at what it's told to look at. So we'll now look at Iraq. We will now, you know, the, the government is doing something to help poor people. It's called welfare. Or we say we're helping poor people. And when the government tells you it's doing something, to assume that that's what it's doing and that's what you should be looking at is to be distracted and directed by the government into looking at a particular area. That happens in Iraq, just as it happens on domestic policy. I mean, governments always want you to look at what they're doing and never want you to look at the, al the alternatives or the opportunity cost. A dollar spent on one project is a dollar not existing somewhere else, but the only photograph you can take is what the government's doing. You can't, there's no photograph of things that don't happen because the government took time, effort, and resources from something else and put them where they want the ca cameras to be. When the government's pointing at Iraq, the cameras tend not to focus on North Korea or Cuba or Venezuela or the lack of international trade or property rights in some region of the world, things that aren't photographic, things that the U.S. government isn't directing their attention to. The press is a lot more directed uh, to focus on those things that the federal, state, or local government wants them to focus on than they like to think. They think they're big, independent critics. When was the last time you saw three networks focus on three different countries in any given night? I mean, if they were independent players, some night you'd see CBS saying, the most important thing is in Sudan today. And another country would say the most important thing is in France. And, and another uh, the TV station would be telling you it's North Korea. I've never in my life seen anything other than have all three major networks tell you that the same things were important, maybe in slightly different order, but usually even in the same order. Um, so how independent, why should they be independent of the government? They're not independent of each other. Well, I think that they are um, using the same uh, algorithm to, uh, to to make their news decisions, and it does seem to be uh, a very driven by mm. the, the White House. And uh, do you think that the government, in a way, understands how the media works better than the media understands how they work themselves? The government's trying to get through the day. They're not that confident. Um, and uh, when people think the government's outsmarting the media, the government out doesn't outsmart many people. Uh, the government sort of does what governments want to do, and the media tends to follow with a TV camera. Um, and where the talking head is, the cameras kind of got to be there. The Secretary of State's in Kuwait, the three networks will be in Kuwait, uh, even though the news, in some objective sense, might be in Kenya that day. But the cameras won't be. And it, I think it's very indicative that you have a unanimity of thought among the three networks and to a certain extent the Washington Post and the New York Times about what's important and when it's important and why does it shift. We go through this periodically where drugs are the number one, drug abuse is the number one issue. And then when it is, it's the number one issue on all three networks and all the newspapers and then four months later it's not the number one issue anymore. And you begin to wonder where that came from. What, why wouldn't it have been the number one issue for CBS one year and NBC the next year at different times. Why at one time? Well, because some government statistic got thrown out and everybody followed that statistic and that became the news. So the government, as the people who put out statistics, put out action, the, um, the media, like a predator, notices movement and follows movement. Um, 
or follows what it thinks of is movement. And, and when you look, okay, when you look at um, you know the uh, the public interest, and you weigh that versus the own private interest, you know, how do you ensure in a market, mm -hmm. a free market economy, how how do you ensure that that public interest is served when it doesn't necessarily serve the profit interests? Okay, well, in a free society, in an open society the public interest is best met by having whoever is providing whatever service, whether it's cleaning your pool or giving, getting you a car or TV news, by having competition. And the failure of the media is the lack of competition and unanimity of, of thinking. Uh, you had the three uh, major car companies basically thinking they had a monopoly. And so they didn't compete sufficiently uh, to provide a better product because they thought they had a monopoly between the three of them and then foreign cars came in. Uh, the three networks thought that they owned the nightly news and so they could be lazy and, and didn't have to be cutting edge and didn't have to come up with new and interesting things. Now that you've got cable coming in, there's a little more uh, diversity and people are all shocked that CNN and Fox have a different take on things. This is a good idea. It should have started 30 years ago. But I think when you look at the actual substance of uh, cable news coverage, they're not doing analysis. Mm -hmm. in, in some cases, they're doing just as worse stenography than the ABC, NBC, or CBS. And so to me, mm -hmm. what the real thing that we should be seeing more of is investigative journalism, the broccoli. And it, the broccoli? Broccoli in the sense that uh, oh, uh, in, versus infotainment. You have a lot of Lacey Peterson. You have a lot of... You know, the hacking family now is the latest mm -hmm. one, or Elizabeth Smart, whatever the tabloid story is at the moment, that's going to be dominating the news cycle as opposed to yeah. analysis. Well, in a free society, you can't make people do things they don't want to do. Okay? It's not like Clockwork Orange where you can sit people down and, and, and pry their eyelids open and make them watch what you want them to watch. If somebody has an idea of what needs to be done, they need to make it interesting and entertainment and available as easily as possible and a four-hour documentary might not work and it may be a two-minute segment uh, marketed to different cable stations. Um, I don't know what the answer is. We haven't had enough people trying to do it. Uh, certainly the History Channel and some of these other channels have demonstrated that things that aren't of general interest, now that you have a hundred stations, you no longer have to be limited to things that 20 million people are willing to watch. You can have 300,000 people watching something and there's a market for it, and it pays. Okay, let me just do a quick time check. Okay, and when you look at, um, you know, from a, a libertarian uh, perspective, mm -hmm. you know, how how do you see, you know, future endeavor? You know, I think there's a debate mm -hmm. between libertarians and uh, neoconservative uh, thinking is the best way to preserve American security. And, and how do you see, you know, where you fall into that debate? Well, you need to reach out and whack down real threats and you also need to not go around making enemies uh, in the world that, that, that needn't be your enemies and that's a prudential call because sometimes you have to step out as I think we did certainly with the Taliban and uh, knock it down and there are other times where if we're wandering around taking a position in some civil war somewhere uh, you end up making half or both sides hate you and perhaps you didn't have to do that and perhaps there was no point to it other than to make enemies and that that's people of goodwill um, can can misjudge where that point is are you doing something helpful or are you poking people and making enemies and so when you look at the issue of humanitarian intervention mm -hmm. um, is it the role of the state to to do uh, within the specific specifically the United States is it our role to conduct humanitarian intervention? I think because governments are so poor at doing whatever they try and do that you really have to um, err on the side of not doing things that are destructive. Um, jumping into the middle of Somalia, did we help? We thought we were helping. We got a couple of Americans killed, but at the end of the day, was this good or bad? Were we even feeding the right guys? Um, so I think you need to think twice on that stuff. The answer is not always no, but it's usually no. And, and when you look at the the shift from a regime change to weapons of mass destruction to humanitarian issues, mm -hmm. and from your reading, you know, why did the United States go to uh, war in Iraq? Um, well, I'd be guessing as to why 
various people in the government supported. I know different people in the government gave different reasons at, at different times, uh, I mean, to the general public, but also to me. I mean, I've, I've heard different analysis as to why they, uh, they thought it was the case. And it's, it's not entirely clear that everybody had the same reason. Okay. And let um, me just check over here real quick. Um, and an issue of uh, international law, you know, how do you see uh, international law and, and the role that it should play with the United, Na with, with the United States? Uh, what the hell is international law? Uh, uh, signing onto the Charter of the United Nations, for example, or uh, any sort of uh, collective agreements of, uh, you know, there's a whole field of international lawyers right. here. And, and so uh, what, what do you feel is, uh, should the United States' role be in that? Um, our job, the U.S. government's job, is to protect the Constitution and the American people from harm from foreigners. To the extent that you can come up with contracts and agreements with other countries that facilitate that, that's fine. Um, but letting other countries, um, whether the dictatorships or democracies, interfere in the internal governments of the United States, no. Okay. And let's see. Um, Oh, and going from uh, this point right now, uh, where do you see uh, kind of a vision for world peace, or what do we need to do to have peace in the entire world? Oh, sure. Uh, the most important thing for a, a, a free and open and peaceful world is to have as many countries as possible part of the trading uh, block where everybody trades freely, where people have property rights and can uh, exchange property freely, and where there's freedom of contract, uh, and then as much as possible freedom of movement. Uh, if those countries where people can own their own home, own their own farmland, uh, trade freely, have freedom of contract, um, that reduces most of the tensions uh, in the world. Where you don't have property rights, where you don't have freedom of contract, where you don't have freedom of mobility, um, you have arbitrary rule, and people reacting to that arbitrary rule by becoming terrorists or rebels or revolutionaries. And, and when you look at the issue of natural resources and natural resource depletion, do you see mm -hmm. it as an issue that the institutional biases of the free market can only see short term and not long term uh, to the point where uh, it's not sustainable in the sense that maybe eventually we're going to run out of oil and it's going to be too late to do anything about it? No, this is what the, the, the left misunderstands. Only the market can think long term. Governments think short term. Markets think long term. Markets will tell you how much oil there is in the world by telling you what the price of oil is, uh, absent some government regulation interfering with that. We've had governments tell us we were running out of oil in the 1900s and 1920s and 1940s and 1950s. Governments never know how much oil there is. Markets have always known uh, what there is in oil, and there was the wonderful uh, debate on the five uh, central products uh, by Ehrlich, the uh, population boom uh, person who argued that we're running out of things, uh, and Julian Simon who argued that no, the market always finds substitutes, uh, and that the price of any five goods that you choose, Mr. Ehrlich, in the next 10 or 20 years will be falling. And of course Ehrlich had to pay because he lost that bet. The market always knows how to plan for the future as long as the governments get out of the way. Okay. And I think that's it. Good. Oh, and yeah, just sit for five, uh, ten seconds and we'll get some ringtone here.